Hello again. Um, this little recording, it's going to be fairly short, is about fission and fusion reactors. Um, just an overview of this nuclear reactions and all this, the parts that are in it. It only actually forms four learning outcomes, but it's a, it's a huge chunk. And there's so much built into each of the four learning outcomes. If you're following the learning outcomes in the boat book, um, nuclear reactions is section 11. And um, these are the parts that go into the four. There's more than um, four learning outcomes. Well, sorry, there are only four learning outcomes, but there are more parts to those four learning outcomes that, than is first apparent. So um, the first recording I did was about atomic number, mass number, isotopes, and nuclear equations. And then we're building on those in the, the last recording I did, e equals mc squared, nuclear fission, and then numerical examples. I split those into two different sections. Um, but once you get the idea of some of these earlier bits, it goes quite quicker. So section or part six was nuclear fusion and a numerical example. And I'm just going to finish off very brief, briefly with fission and fusion reactors. Um, I'm aware that there was a question in the forces on charged particles block test that actually referred to this. But I was hoping that you were going to remember what you had done at National 5. Remember, you need to remember everything you've done at National 5 in order to get through higher. Higher is really difficult to do as a standalone subject. But I am going through the revision topics. Uh, that's one I sort of skipped over. Um, was the, the, the how a fission reactor works. So uh, this is just going to hopefully wind up this last bit of, of work here in this section 11 in the boat book. So I'm going to break this last section into two parts. We're going to look at uh, fission reactors. And this is just to put together some of the ideas that we've already done um in this this little uh, topic <clears throat> okay so uh, what's the what's the idea of a fission reactor uh, a fission reactor uses the idea of mass deficit that you start off with um, a radioactive atom you bombard it uh, to give you induced fission that induced fission results in daughter products plus the release of neutrons which can then go on to do more fission plus energy, and it's that mass deficit, the mass before the collision and the mass afterwards that you work out, the mass deficit, and then you put that into the formula e equals mc squared, and that tells you about the energy that is available from a fission reaction or fission reactor even. Okay, so uh, the idea is to use that, um, that induced reaction in some big power plant. So what do we need? Well, first of all, we need some, I'm going to do this quite simply. We need some things called fuel rods. Now, if you look down on top of a nuclear reactor, they tend to be circular and they have a top plate and the plate has holes in them, many, many holes. And the fuel rods um, are loaded up through holes into uh, the reactor body. So that's looking down. So this is just looking at three of a number of fuel rods. As well as the fuel rods, uh, you need to lower in some stuff called the moderator. And the moderator, if you remember, is the material that um, slows down the fast neutrons. And my lines are a bit wibbly here, but uh, wibbly is a variation on wobbly. Um, but around the fuel rods you have a moderator because the neutrons that are released in the fission reaction are fast moving. They're called fast neutrons, funnily enough, and you need to slow them down. Um, so what you do is you slow them down with this moderator material. And uh, once the um, neutrons have been slowed down, then the next bit of those four neutrons uh, causing more fission in that hopefully controlled reaction. You don't want a big chain reaction. Hopefully that will um, slow them down enough. Uh, now the in-between, the 
fuel rods and the moderators, you have removable control rods. And these are also lowered in and out through little portholes in the top plate of the reactor. I'm just going to draw a couple of these. And the idea of these control rods, and the control rods are made of graphite, which is the same stuff that's in the middle of your pencil. Uh, I know pencil lead is what it used to be called, but uh, it's no longer lead. Neither is the material that absorbs all of the, the neutrons flying around. Neither is that lead. It's actually graphite. So um, you can lower these control rods into place. And when they are in place fully, they will stop all the neutrons moving around inside the reactor. And I've already mentioned in UK reactors how these rods uh, are put in and out. They're lowered up and down with some electromagnetic system that if the electricity supply fails, they just drop into place and then the whole reactor is shut down. Um, so you've got the moderator, which I've done here. Sorry, fuel rod, moderator, I've done in green. In green, I've got fuel rods. In blue, and I've got control rods. Also in blue, but shaded in blue. Okay, now all of that lot um, lives inside a huge uh, concrete and lead-lined reactor vessel. So the whole thing is... surrounded by many meters these control rods are lowered in and out many meters of concrete and lead okay but surrounding the uh, all of this material the rods the moderators the control rods is um, possibly some water uh, kept under high pressure so if we've got water in here and the idea of the water circulating around is it takes away the kinetic energy. Remember, the kinetic energy produces heat. So you've got these neutrons flying around all over the place. They bump in to material like the, the circulating water and they heat the water up and the water turns to steam. Um, you can use other um, materials that take the heat away, the coolants. And there are a number of different reactor designs around the world that use different types of, of um, liquid material that flow around. So we'll put in here some, um, through a pipe, we'll put in some cold water, which may be pressurized. This type of reactor that's used a lot in the UK is called a pressurized water reactor. And the whole thing's a huge pressure vessel. And then out of a, another pipe or pipes, you'll take out uh, your water by which time your water has changed into, uh, no, it's actually still a pressurized water and it goes into a, uh, an exchange vessel where that pressurized water will heat up through a system of pipes will heat up some circulating water and it will turn the water in the this ancillary pressure vessel, it will turn the water into steam. So you've got cold water going in, hot water coming back out somewhere. And then in these pipes, you've got cold water coming in as well and steam coming out. Now this water can get um, radi become radioactive, so you don't let this out anywhere else. It tends to stay inside uh, a big, huge, big tank that contains everything. So I've got this pressurized, very hot pressurized water going into this heat exchanger, and you won't be asked to draw any of this. Um, <clears throat> And that can get fed back in. Over here, it's got slightly cooler, could come in that side as well. Uh, so the cool, cold water goes in a separate system of pipes, turns to steam, the steam comes out, 
the steam goes off to turn a turbine and the turbine's connected to a generator. And I'm sure that um, you know about most of this. Uh, the, the important things is the moderator to change, uh, higher anyways, the moderator to change the fast neutrons to slow neutrons, uh, the control rods to soak up all of the neutrons when the control rods are fully dropped down into the reactor. Um, the enormous amount of concrete and water and lead that surrounds the whole thing. Um, heat exchanger out to the side, takes the heat of the pressurized water, turns cold water into steam. Steam goes to the turbine, turbine goes to the generator. Um, and that's about it for a fission reactor. That's really all you need to do. Um, you don't need to draw the diagrams. You can talk about the whole process of the fuel in the fuel rods uh, being uh, undergoing fission and that releasing energy through the whole mass deficit thing equals mc squared. So you could write a passage about the whole thing being faced with a diagram and explain how it all works. Fission reactors then. And much of that really should be um, revision from National 5. Uh, and again, this next bit about fusion reactors is also revision but we need to do a little bit more about this so we've got our fusion uh, products and components we've got hydrogen mainly different types of hydrogen ordinary hydrogen 1-1 one, one, uh, deuterium 2-1 tritium 3-1 we've got all the equations for that and we will combine these amounts different amounts of deuterium and tritium or deuterium and deuterium, which in turn makes tritium. We've got all the formulae for that. That has to take place in this thing called a fusion reactor. Now, if we have a look <coughs> at um, deuterium and add it to some more deuterium, um, basically we've got protons which have a positive charge and protons here that have a positive charge plus neutrons that we can ignore really in terms of their charge. Now getting two charged particles together is a bit of a problem uh, because all they want to do if you try and put them together because they're two positive charges coming together is all they want to do is repel each other. So what we need to do is we need to take this deuterium or the deuterium and the tritium and we need to heat it up and when you heat up um, the material, it then starts moving around more. It's got more kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy of these particles moving towards each other and smacking into each other is more than enough to overcome the positive repelling charges. So heat makes these particles move very fast. Well, the first thing you do actually do is you start with your water and heat will make the hydrogen and the oxygen uh, disassociate, will break up the molecule of water, will break it up into atoms. And we're not interested in the oxygen, really. What we want is the, um, the hydrogen. And the hydrogen is still an atom. It's two hydrogen atoms joined together. Still a molecule. We want to split it into two hydrogen atoms. I hope I said that right. So that's still a molecule of two hydrogen atoms. And we want to split up these hydrogen molecules into our individual um, hydrogen, our deuterium and our tritium into atoms. And then we want to overcome what's called the electrostatic repulsion. And as I said before, we heat up the, the, the now gases uh, which are very, very fast moving atoms. We heat them up and they're moving so fast that they come together very, very fast. And although the positive charges are trying to force them apart, they've got so much energy that they actually overcome that uh, natural repulsion and they stick together. Now, the temperature to which you need to get these hydrogen atoms to, to get them moving so fast that they overcome the electrostatic force is really, really hot. So we're not talking about, you know, sort of a couple of hundred degrees C. We're talking about uh, millions of degrees. Uh, and by the time you get it up to millions of degrees, you end up with something called a plasma. 
So this, uh, the, the material that's going in has, is undergoing a number of stages where heat just breaks them up progressively, molecules of water to molecules of hydrogen to atoms of hydrogen, which then can stick together. Uh, and that's fusion. That's what's called fusion. So what sort of temperatures? Well, probably 100 million and they start talking about temperatures in Kelvin rather than degrees C. <clears throat> now, that is comparable to the temperature of the sun. Uh, and that's exactly what goes on inside the sun. The sun is a huge fusion reactor uh, where um, hydrogen and helium um, atoms are heated up by a plasma into a plasma. How does that happen? Well, the reaction has started some millions, billions of years ago, and it's a sort of self-sustaining reaction that um, once these particles start knocking together, they produce heat. Heat makes more uh, energy. That raises the temperature. More temperature makes them stick together even better, fuse together better. So to do that, you need extremely high temperatures to get your atoms into something called a plasma. So you've got this soup of um, atoms, bits of oxygen left over, uh, electrons, all mashing around in this, this thing called a plasma. Uh, so 100 million Kelvin, well, if you tried to heat something to 100 million Kelvin in the laboratory, the, the heat would be so much that the heat would destroy the container uh, the, the heat would just melt through the walls of the container. So physicists have found that you need uh, to use magnetic fields to keep this plasma. This is a, a, a morass of charged particles. We can keep the charged particles away from the walls of the container, far enough away so that the actual hot plasma doesn't melt the walls of the container and escape. And um, it's, t it's taking years. I remember when I was much younger, your age, that I was told that fusion reactors would be a thing in about 30 years time. Uh, 30 years later, they said, well, it's going to take another 30 years. And it's taking a long time to get this technology working out. How to contain this plasma at this very, very high temperature uh, requires enormously strong magnetic fields. How do you make your magnetic fields? You make your magnetic fields from electricity. So you need to tap into the, the national grid's electricity supply. You're using a huge amount of electricity to heat up to get this plasma. Then to contain the plasma inside, so that's electricity being used twice, once to heat it, to contain it inside the reactor requires huge electromagnets, which again uses electricity. So this whole thing is a big, big electricity user. Uh, unfortunately, um, when you get this, uh, this fusion reaction taking place, the energy that you get out is less than the electrical energy at the moment that you put in. So it's just not worth your while trying to do that commercially. Uh, if you only get less energy out than the energy you put in, it's not very efficient at all. Um, so how do the magnetic fields work? Well, the magnetic fields work because you have a thing. It's basically like a donut. The, the fusion um, reactor is a imagine a, a hollow, not a jammy donut, but a sugary donut on the outside, a ring donut. Imagine a hollow ring donut and the posh name for a hollow ring donut is something called a torus and then you'll take your wires and the wires are wrapped round and round and round the donut here uh, to make the magnetic field um, and then you'll have some way of getting your gas in you'll have pipes to get all your gas in um, your hydrogen gas uh, and then um, a heating system as well, and then the electricity to make the magnetic field. So the, what's the purpose of this? You get the best uh, results out, and they're by no means marvellous. You get the best results if you have this hollow donut called a torus with this enormous magnetic field to keep the plasma away from the walls. Uh, and it helps if you get the, the plasma 
rotating round inside here as well. Um, you can actually go online and you can see what happens. They've got cameras installed through looking through uh, very strong heat resistance. Remember, the magnetic field keeps the heat away from the walls. So you can have a little porthole here and you can have a camera going inside. And it's, it's not very exciting to see because you can't really see this gas uh, and you, you can't really see much of it when it's uh, when it gets very, very hot. It does tend to change color a little bit and starts to glow. Uh, so you can look and see what happens inside these uh, reactors. But these are really experimental. Um, uh, Britain's got one of the largest um, experimental fusion reactors. It's called the JET Fusion Reactor, and that stands for Joint European Taurus. Um, quite what's happening now, we've left Europe, I don't know, but this is down in Oxfordshire, and it's an enormous great big building that's got this hollow donut in with all the electricity supplies and magnets and everything else. It's, um, it's quite something. Right, so that's really all you need to know is that um, you extract your hydrogen gas from your water. You've got hydrogen molecules which are heated to turn into atoms, which are again heated to turn into plasma. The plasma is kept away from the walls of the uh, containment vessel by a huge magnetic field. All of this heating and magnetic field um, uses enormous amount of electricity and the electricity you get out when the whole thing's really hot it works just like a fission reactor you pump cold water around it and you get the water coming out is is a steam the steam turns a turbine turbine turns the, the um, generator etc um, so the problems are with it uh, to turn it from an experimental um, piece of machinery into something that actually works and having these dotted around all over the country. There are loads of fission reactors. Um, there's at least three in Scotland. One of them's being decommissioned at Doonray. There's one at Hunterston near Glasgow. There's one at Torness near Berwick. Um, plus there's a lot of other secret ones. Um, well, I'll have to kill you if I tell you where they all are, but they're basically on submarines, uh, miniature pressurized water reactors on nuclear submarines at Thas Lane on the West Coast. Um, so fission reactors are all over the place, um, and a fission reactor that goes in the submarine isn't much bigger than a, um, your living room. It's, it's pretty small, pretty compact, uh, and that can keep you going underwater. It can supply all your energy for fuel to drive the motors. Uh, it can take seawater, turn seawater into oxygen and hydrogen, and it can get rid of carbon dioxide with all sorts of chemical stuff. Um, so, uh, reactors fission reactors are all over the place but fusion reactors there's very very few of them um, and as far as i know this is the only one in the uk an alternative name for the taurus is a word which is tokomak which i understand is russian the russian word for a taurus or for a hollow donut so you may come across this tokomak or taurus as words uh, if you're doing exam questions. Okay, and that's fairly short, and I'm going to stop that recording now because that brings to an end uh, the entire uh, nuclear reaction section, section 11, and uh, the next lesson that I'll be recording will be about section number 12, obviously, if this was 11 which is on something called the in inverse square law. More of that later.